All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening or good morning, depending on wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the webinar on market risk and counterparty trade risk uh, in Python. Um, this course uh, has a regulatory focus. So <clears throat> we will be primarily focusing on regulatory capital models uh, in market risk as well as counterparty trade risk in this session. Um, this session will last for about one hour, including Q&A and everything, so you can plan your activities accordingly. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat. And there will be a dedicated Q&A session after I uh, finish the core uh, um, agenda of our session today. So there you can ask me any questions related to the course, logistics, timeline, uh, all those uh, kind of things. Uh, all right. So uh, before I start a little bit about me, uh, some of you already know me. Uh, so I am, you can call me Satya. Um, Karan and I are partners in Peaks to Tails. So I have taken two courses in Peaks to Tails. One is called Bootcamp in Quant Finance, which is um, more than, uh, which is close to 300 hours uh, um, course that uh, focuses on uh, using usage of stochastic calculus in derivative valuation, mostly. Um, other than that, I have covered pretty much everything in that course, um, counterparty patents, Monte Carlo. So you'll find lots and lots of uh, uh, use cases, both in valuation and risk management in that course. Um, it's called Bootcamp in Quant Finance. If you uh, are interested, feel free to reach out to me or Karan Sar after the course. And the other course that I've taken is uh, called uh, uh, FDP, which stands for Finance Data Professional. And that, uh, that course focuses on machine learning algorithms and the use of machine learning algorithms in finance. All right, so uh, that's about uh, the courses that I've taken in Peaks to Tales. And I am an IIT IM graduate, uh, also have a FRM charter. And I have more than 10 years of experience in uh, capital markets and uh, risk modeling. Okay, so that's about me. And um, yeah, I already see some questions coming in the uh, uh, chat box about uh, prerequisites and all, all these things. Um, I would say, please hold on to your questions till the end of the presentation. Um, uh, we will take all of your questions uh, in the Q&A uh, section, if that's okay with you. And uh, yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, this session is about, uh, so this course is about market risk and counterparty trade risk in Python. So first question is, uh, what do we want to get out of this course? Why are you all here today? Feel free to, uh, you know, answer in the uh, chat box. What is the reason why you are here today? I want the session to be as interactive as possible. <clears throat> For all the logistics questions, we can take it after the uh, core agenda. Please respond, guys. Why are we all here today? What do you want to get out of this course? <clears throat> Okay, majorly understand the Python practicality with respect to market to CCR. That's interesting. Okay. Any anyone else? Upskill, uh, risk application, applicability in industry, learn metrics on market risk, upskill, upskill. Okay. Okay. Practical point of view of job purpose. Exactly. Okay. All right. So all of you are here primarily to learn beyond what is taught in your regular academic courses and popular certifications and uh, to ensure or to be more um, sort of employable um, in the uh, current industry um, uh, environment. So yeah, so primarily we are here to learn more about market risk, counterparty credit risk and applications um, in Python and um, so, so that you can land a good job essentially, right? So that is the sort of core focus of this course. It is a practical course. So I will be focusing on uh, the regulatory capital models that are in place today. And we will go through worked out examples, detailed uh, worked out examples in Python. Uh, so at the end of the course, you will be trained sufficiently to be able to create 
or implement regulatory models in Python. And uh, we uh, talked about jobs, right? So let's start from there. So where do we want to get uh, into after this course uh, is basically to land a good job. So I did uh, uh, a search last night in LinkedIn to see what are the kinds of jobs uh, that are open in market risk space today. So here are some of the uh, jo jobs that I've highlighted. There, there were 4,500 results. So that many positions are open in various investment banks and uh, uh, consulting firms. So in market risk, if I want to highlight a few uh, keywords, right? So notice here we have uh, FRTB. Okay. I just want to ensure you guys are able to hear me and see my screen, right? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so just highlighting a few uh, pointers here, FRTB, okay, uh, model validation, all right. I want to uh, all of you uh, to go back and just browse LinkedIn or any, you know, Nokri.com and go through these market risk profiles and see what kind of skills they're looking for, all right. All of these jobs that I looked at uh, have a median salary of, uh, you know, between... 25 lakhs to 50 lakhs, depending on your experience, obviously. So it's a very, very uh, lucrative profession. Okay. I don't have to justify that. You probably have already figured that out. But yeah, I mean, to, just to get a feel of what kind of uh, job descriptions are there for, you know, these kind of roles, uh, you know, log into LinkedIn and find, uh, go through these job descriptions to get an understanding of what, what are the skills they're looking at. Okay. So, and also I looked at uh, counterparty trade risk uh, profile. So again, highlighting some uh, keywords. Uh, so we have uh, XVA quant, uh, CVA quant, right? And uh, counterparty trade risk, right? So, um, so for all these jobs, what are the skills that you need? If we look at the skill matrix, right? So we are doing a backward uh, scheduling. This is our target. We want to get a good job in market risk and or counterparty trade risk. For that, what kind of skills are needed? So if I go to skill requirements, first skill that you need is domain knowledge. Okay. Go through the job descriptions and just try to summarize what all they are looking for. If I want to summarize, there are three main requirements. Number one is domain knowledge. So within market risk, you have, uh, you need all these things. Starting with, you know, your fundamentals about probability, statistics, calculus, linear algebra, those uh, need to be really, really strong for a market risk professional. Um, then you need to have basic idea about valuation of all asset classes. Now, valuation is a very deep subject. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in BQF, I have covered valuation uh, um, in depth, all right? Uh, for, so there are different types of valuation, but in market is we're not focusing on different, uh, you know, valuation theory per se, but you need to know like what are the payoffs and basic valuation uh, methodology for the instruments. Now, the third point is the, is the most important aspect of market risk. It's called sensitivity and Greeks, right? So in market risk, primarily, I would say 70% of the uh, core market risk calculation is based around calculation of sensitivities and Greeks. Okay. So that's like the backbone of um, today's market risk methodology. So we'll talk more about that. And then how to cap calculate the various uh, market risk uh, metrics. So uh, some of you that who have gone through FRM and uh, CFA probably know about value at risk and expected shortfall, but that is uh, those are the key metrics that are uh, used today to capture market risk. So we will cover every uh, all of these in our course. Um, I see some of the uh, logistic questions coming up. Uh, please hold your uh, hold these kind of questions till the end of the presentation. Uh, roughly give me a half an hour. Let me go through the core agenda, then we'll go through all of your questions systematically. Um, okay, so. And then there is regulatory capital models. This is the focus of this course. So in market risk, uh, as you know, we have um, Basel III and the, the, the 
keyword that I all uh, uh, highlighted a while ago, that is FRTB, right? That's the new regulation for market risk. So the focus of this course is to do an in-depth study of the latest market risk regulation, that is FRTB, understand all the capital models, the maths behind them, and implement everything in Python, starting with simple instruments to complicated portfolios. All right. Um, so we'll talk more about that. And there is PNL and backtesting. So we will also come, come back to this later. And in counterparty credit space, you need to know how to create exposure profiles of derivatives at different times. All right. Um, we will, I have a slide on this. We'll talk more about this. And CVA, remember we saw this word in the uh, one of the job descriptions, right? CVA stands for credit value adjustment. Okay, so that's uh, also a quantitative uh, um, metric that we need to calculate. A lot of jobs are there in, in CVA, in market space. I don't have to you know, justify again and again. You feel free to go to LinkedIn or any other job website and just look at the jobs that are open in market risk and counterparty credit risk. These are hot areas today. And there is good reason for that. This latest regulation that came, right, FRTB, banks have to be compliant. Uh, originally, it was planned that bank, all the banks have to be compliant by January 1st, 2023. But they have not. Okay, they are still lagging. So banks are pushing because it's a, it's a radical change. I will show you what was the previous methodology and what's the new methodology and what are the changes. But uh, this is the new standard. So everybody has to comply with uh, it. And that's why you see a lot of job openings in this space. Banks are trying to frantically hire people who can understand the uh, latest market risk methodology, that is FRTV, and help them implement the new models. Okay. So that's why you see a lot of jobs. All right. So this is the core skill set that, that you will find common across all these profiles that I just highlighted. Domain knowledge is number one. Okay. Next, technical skills. In today's world, you have to know coding. If you are in a quant profile, or if you want to be in a quant profile, when I say quant, it means valuation or risk management um, or even analyst role. Okay, You have to have some background of coding. And of course, if you want to learn machine learning, obviously you have to know coding, right? Uh, earlier days, it was difficult. Uh, I mean, we, we had C++, uh, C, Java. I mean, they provide a lot of flexibility, but today everybody is doing Python. Okay. This course is about uh, building regulatory capital models using Python. Okay. Why Python? I, I mean, we can talk about this in detail when we start the live classes. But let me tell you this. So, if I want to, so let's say, calculate value at risk in C, I'll have to write probably. I don't know, 10 lines of code in Python or 10 or more, it could be 20. In Python, I can calculate the value at risk of, an, of a call option on real data in five lines. Okay. Because that today there are that many packages available in Python and it's free open source. So Python has a rich community and um, there are plenty of libraries already available for you to just import them, run them, and that gives you the results. You don't have to write everything from scratch again and again. So that's why Python has become immensely popular today. Especially Python has taken off like a rocket just because of machine learning primarily. But just because, you know, there are lots and lots of packages available today, you just have to plug and play. It's like a Lego block game, right? You just fit the Legos and you get the product. Right, so that's why Python has become popular, and it's uh, from a cost structure standpoint, banks are moving to Python. Earlier, they, I mean, banks used uh, MATLAB or uh, SAS, but today they are trying to go to Python uh, because code base is easier, smaller, and from a cost cost structure standpoint, it is uh, less costly. If you can, so long story short, right? If you can demonstrate that you know about market risk and counterparty credit, that's the first part. 
and you can confidently say that i know how to build algorithms in python we will get all you'll get uh, any job that you want there is nothing that will stop you today this skill this combination is rare there are people who are expert and subject matter i mean subject matter expert in domain but they don't know anything about coding right and typical developers that we have i'm talking about india so i'm based out of us here the things are a little bit different but developers who are very good in python or you know any other coding language do not get the uh, you know domain knowledge so you need to you know master both of these to be a complete quant professional so that's the need of the hour today and that's what this course is all about all right okay and in the job description you'll find sometimes they mention specific tools that you must have experience in uh, calypso or murex or there is a product from moody's called as risk authority so these are commercial off the shelf products that uh, um banks use okay these are like ready made risk solutions so only when you get into a job and you know get the opportunity to work on such a tool you'll uh, uh, learn about the tool there is no way that you can learn it uh, you know uh, outside unless you take a specific certification in these uh, to know about the tools and okay so the third skill is uh, interpersonal skills so that's like that's that's hr right so good communication stakeholder management client interfacing skills and then documentation documentation is um uh, underrated okay in in a banking environment documentation is extremely important okay so these are the three i would say if you i mean there are three dimensions in which you can uh, factor the skills that are required to excel in today's job world today now if you look at different types of profiles that are asked okay which kind of profile needs what kind of skill that's the next question so let's see the first profile is quant developer so if you want to get into model development okay that's a hot uh, area here in uh, us okay um and they get a very very they get really really good salary so for that your domain knowledge and coding skills have to be at the expert level all right and interpersonal skills really don't matter that much you you if you are looking for a you know a model development role yes you have to talk to different stakeholders understand the requirement but you really don't uh, need you know an excellent communication skills to be part of model development i mean this is all relative okay let's look at the next profile model validation okay uh that is the another kind of profile you see so in model validation what we do is uh basically there are checks and balances right when somebody creates a model developed model before it gets shipped into live environment there are various checks uh you have to check various assumptions so for example uh, is the time series stationary or not uh, is, if there is a normal distribution assumption it is really valid or not okay so model validation is about all you know there is a checklist you have to go through all of these uh, checks and balances and certify yes the model has the level of mathematical integrity to be to be used um okay in live environment it's before the new model is shipped and also there is periodic validation right your assumptions could be valid today it could be invalid tomorrow right so that's model validation rule uh, validation profile and for that you obviously again you need domain knowledge domain knowledge is always required okay and uh, also sometimes you need to uh, you know understand the code and be able to debug the code so definitely you need some coding skills there doesn't have to be at the developer level but uh, definitely you need to understand the python code and be able to help uh, debug the code okay and find out potential issues and you need uh, definitely some um, interpersonal skills as well 
And there is a third type of uh, profile, which is like a business analyst or consultant. Okay. Now, in consulting organizations like uh, EY or KPMG, you will mostly you'll find these kind of profiles, analysts. There are analyst profiles in banks as well. But uh, what kind of skills you need to perform well as an analyst? Again, domain knowledge, this is this cannot be compromised, okay? You have to be subject matter expert. Um, technical skills, you probably don't need that much to be, an, to be a good analyst. Uh, but the story is different in uh, US, okay? Even if you're an analyst, you still need to, your IT skills to, still needs to be at the expert level. Uh, but in India, not so much, okay? And then you also have to have, so this becomes important, right? Stakeholder management, client interfacing skills. So it's all about, uh, you know, um, meeting with different stakeholders, understanding the requirements, translating those requirements into actual deliverables and seeing the end-to-end -end uh, development. So basically provide oversight uh, overall, okay? Um, from end-to-end, -end. so that's what the role is. Okay, so yeah, so depending on where, so this, this skill metrics gives you an idea of where you want to uh, go, okay? But irrespective of the role, domain knowledge and coding are mandatory skills in today's world, okay? The third skill, obviously, that's up to you, how you, that, that's who you are. We are not training that. So what is this course all about? This course is about, these three aspects you will be trained on the uh, on the subject okay so that you can answer all the questions in the interview we will train you specifically of you know how to ace market risk counterparty creators interview questions um yeah as i mentioned earlier right this the focus of this course is not uh, exactly to go through all the theories and derive everything from scratch i have done that before in my previous two courses. Focus of this course is more applicative. So we will understand the maths as much as it's needed, but focus will be more in, uh, in terms of implementation. How can we build a model from scratch uh, with all the checks and balances, data preparation, and um, uh, building a model and doing sanity check uh, in, in Python, okay? So that's the focus of this course. So we will focus on market risk, uh, create, counterparty creators, capital models, and implementing everything in Python. We are not doing C++, we are doing uh, in Python. Okay, I'll just pause here uh, for you to grasp everything I said. Any questions on this? Uh, feel free to post your questions in the chat uh, at the moment. I'll take... Um, I'll turn an audio uh, after the uh, in in the Q and A session. Okay. So yes, we will cover development as well as validation. I'll take I'll show you the syllabus slide. There we'll uh, go through all the contents of the course. Uh, yeah. So let let let's let's proceed. I know these questions. So I have answers to all these questions in the upcoming slides. Let's go quickly. Um, so. Our mission, so my, my mission of this particular course is to build, to train you to build subject matter expertise in regulatory capital models, okay, around market risk and counterparty create risk, so that you are able to develop and validate risk models independently. That is important. My job is to ensure that you get enough mathematical maturity um, to and subject knowledge about regulatory capital models. So given a chance, you can independently build algorithms to implement a particular risk model, okay? Uh, now, to be a real developer, you need to also, I mean, you, you need to have some um, uh, exposure as an architect, okay? So there are a lot of many uh, other things that comes in development. But as far as developing an algorithm in Python is concerned to implement a particular risk model, you should be able to do that independently. That's that's my job. Okay, all right, so let's proceed. 
So I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, bore you, you with all the technical details in this particular webinar, because this is not the, the, not the forum to talk about the various aspects, but I'll just quickly scan through the uh, background and uh, what are the things that are there and what we'll be learning in this course, all right? So what is market risk and what is market risk capital charge? Market risk is the risk of losses that can potentially come from movement in market prices okay you have a trading portfolio it has stocks bonds options all kind of kinds of things now those the value of those instruments depend on market prices also called as risk factors right so what are the risk factors the risk factors are commodity prices equity prices so let's say you have a call option stock uh, on stock the underlier is your equity price. If the equity price moves, the value of the call option changes, right? Similarly, interest rates. Uh, what kind of instruments will be sensitive to interest rates? What kind of instruments will be sensitive to interest rates? Bonds, exactly. Bonds, interest rate swaps, um yeah interested futures right there is also credit spread okay so here is the thing so when so look at a bond okay value of the bond depends on interest rate also there is credit spread of the issuer the underlying interest rate let's say it's the fed funds rate okay uh, which is the base rate that could be same, but the credit spread of the issuer might change. So because of change in credit worthiness of the issuer, there is impact on the value of the bond. So that we also capture. So that credit spread is also a risk factor. Okay. And then we have foreign exchange. So if you have a FX portfolio, if the FX rate changes, your value changes. So market risk is all about assessing or measuring the loss in your portfolio that can arise in arise because of uh, you know movement in market factors like these ones and in basel we have we know this is the uh, the governing equation right the total capital the bank has to keep in buffer has to be at least 8% of the risk weighted assets okay the total capital as in equity capital tier 1 tier 2 capital capital must be adequate uh, and it should be at least 8% of your risk weighted assets. The more risk you take, your assets become risky. Accordingly, you're, you have to keep more capital so that this ratio is maintained. This is called the capital adequacy ratio. Uh, all right. So this is uh, the minimum capital requirements. This much capital you need to keep to do business. Otherwise, you cannot do business. All right. So uh, if you look at the formula carefully. So if you have already calculated the RWAs, which stands for risk weighted assets, then accordingly, how much capital you need to keep, you can calculate from this. But sometimes we don't calculate RWA, we directly calculate the capital charge. So for example, mark, if you look at just the market risk part, right? So the capital that is needed to uh, cover market risk related losses, that divided by RWA market must be greater than 8%. All right. So market risk capital charge uh, is given as, um, uh, so we, if you want to calculate RWA market, that is 1 by 8% market risk capital charge. So in this equation, the first equation, right, that's the main equation of uh, uh, Basel III regulatory uh, uh, capital adequacy ratio. RWA market is calculated as 12.5. This is just 1 by 8% times market risk capital charge. So we first estimate the market risk capital charge, and then we calculate the RWA by multiplying it 12.5. And then that goes into this equation in the denominator. OK, you'll find this uh, as the standard uh, standard way of you know, either if you can calculate RWA, that's that's good. If you if you don't calculate RWA, but instead you calculate the capital charge, then you have to multiply twelve point five to convert into RWA. So in market risk world, what we estimate is this. 
market is capital charge. Okay. So yeah, that's what market is capital charge. So I hope you understood, right? What is the requirement of keeping enough capital? Uh, because if you take, you know, create risky assets, obviously your assets assets can lose value. And if it if your total asset falls below your liability, then you go bankrupt. Simple. So you need to have enough capital. And the extent of capital depends on how risky your asset is. And if we isolate this equation for just for market risk, this is what it comes down to. So we have to estimate market risk capital charge. Now, how to estimate market risk capital charge? I'll just give you an overview. So you have those who have studied uh, in uh, FRM, right? Already uh, would have gone through this process, but they don't tell you systematically how the whole thing works. So I've tried to paint a very simple picture that will tell you exactly how market risk capital charge is calculated. Um, and we will come back to this, uh, this particular scheme again and again, okay? Um, because this, uh, the broad scheme of things of how to calculate mar uh, market risk capital charge is important. So you have to be comfortable with this uh, particular um, framework that, I, that I'll just show you. Before that, when I said market risk capital charge, what we are trying to calculate is you have a trading portfolio. On a given day, how much you can lose? Right, that's that's the potential market risk loss, and against that, I will keep capital to absorb that loss. Straightforward. All right, and when you estimate the loss, it has to be a very conservative estimate. It's not like uh, expected loss. It's it will be a worst possible loss or unexpected loss, and we typically do do that with uh, the help of some confidence interval. We'll learn all about all of these uh, in detail when we uh you know do uh, when we uh, work on the actual model so don't worry about that i'm just giving an overview so here is the thing so we talked about risk factors right so in the bank imagine there is a complicated portfolio how many instruments are there in a bank lots and lots of instruments right and all those instruments are tied to lots of lo lots and lots of risk factors so let's say there are lots, there are n risk factors, okay, R1, R2, Rn. Now, the instruments that bank has, so let's say there are two instruments, B, V1 and V2. The value of the first instrument depends on the risk factor R1. Value of the second instrument depends on two risk factors R1, R2. Okay, this, that's the second step. Now, at this point, what we want to do is something called as risk factor mapping. That means which instrument is sensitive to which risk factor. That's called risk factor mapping. So here you can see the first instrument is a function of R1. Second instrument is a function of both these two risk factors, right? Portfolio value, your total value of the trading portfolio is simply the sum of the values of the instruments. So this is, this is straightforward, V1 plus V2. Now, this is what you have today, all right? What will happen tomorrow? Risk factors will change, instrument values will change, portfolio value will change. What I want to capture in market risk is what is my worst possible loss in trading port in my entire portfolio. And accordingly, I will keep sufficient equity capital to absorb that loss. That's the grand scheme of things. But now how do we calculate this? As I said, right? Risk factors change will drive the change in instrument values and change in instrument values will drive the change in portfolio value. So now it's an exercise of how to roll up the changes from risk factors to instruments to portfolio. Correct? So first step would be to estimate the worst change in risk factor. So there is a stock. Tomorrow, how... Uh, what will be the worst case, worst possible fall in that stock price, right? Depends on your position, whether you have a long position, short position, accordingly, you know, the direction of change uh, that you would be interested in would be different. But ultimately, I want to measure the worst possible uh, change in the risk factor. How do we estimate this? 
there are three methods primarily. One is historical. I'll just go back in history, okay? And I'll see how much this factor, uh, this particular delta R1 can be. Uh, so I will sort the uh, changes in, let's say, uh, ascending order. And then I'll take the worst possible, let's say the worst 5% value of the first risk factor. That's my estimate of the worst possible change. Simply looking at historical data. All right. Second way would be to fit a distribution. That is called as parametric. I will assume, okay, risk factor follows normal distribution. If you have a normal distribution, all you need is mu and sigma. And then you have the entire loss, uh, the entire distribution specified is called parametric. And uh, from the distribution, you can estimate a worst possible uh, change, right? Mu minus sigma z. I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, stress on mathematical details in this uh, slide, but these are some of the ways that you can do it. And the third possible way you can estimate the change is simulation, Monte Carlo. Typically, you'll do Monte Carlo when there is the instrument is has path dependency, okay? So it's not straightforward to approximate uh, changes in a you know uh, linear fashion or uh, that easily. There are heavy path dependencies, so then you need to do uh, Monte Carlo. Okay, all of this we will do in Python. But the purpose of this slide is this is the big picture, and I want to give you the maturity and um, you know, flexibility so that you can e seamlessly calculate different risk measures using any of the three methods very, very easily and naturally. You don't have to remember any formula. It will come naturally to you. This is all there is, okay? It's, it's all, I mean, it's all the uh, methodologies and different things are built around this particular idea. So we got the worst, worst change in risk factors. Now we roll up these changes to the instrument level. Okay, delta R1 will trigger a change in, in V1, that is delta V1. Similarly, delta R1, delta R2 together will uh, lead to change in V2, delta V2. How do we estimate this change, right, from this factor to instrument value? There are two methods. One is called local valuation, that is through sensitivities. Now, this is the backbone of today's market risk methodology. Everything is through sensitivities. Our major focus, focus in mod, module one would be to understand sensitivities, you know, as uh, easily as possible. So sensitivities is, is king in market risk. All right, everybody takes uh, this route. This is the popular route because this is uh, less expensive. Okay. So all when I say sensitivity, think of uh, beta in CAPM, think of Greeks in option. Those are all sensitivities, all right? And there is also full valuation. So full valuation, uh, one example would be when you are using Monte Carlo, you have to use full valuation. And you will use full valuation when the instruments are like exotic, they have path dependency, uh, time dependency. So th there you will use full valuation. Once you estimate the change in uh, value of the instruments, the final step is to aggregate those changes to the portfolio level. All right. That's it. That's how you calculate uh, market risk capital charge. I excluded all the, you know, all the quirky mathematical details, but this is what we will be doing primarily in module one to be, you know, to move seamlessly between step one to step two to step three, given any instrument or any combination of instruments, given risk factor, use all these three different methods and calculate the market risk capital charge in Python. Okay. Uh, and believe me, this is like, uh, once you are thorough with this, the FRTV methodology that we have today, is exactly this, it, it follows this particular route. Two-step aggregation using sensitivities. That's the FRTV methodology, it's just an aggregation process. But you, by the time we look at regulatory models, you would already be uh, doing it yourself. 
okay the formulas would come very naturally to you you don't have to remember anything it will be natural okay so that's about, that's uh, all about market risk capital charge moving on we will come back to this slide if needed uh, later on so here's a brief history of uh, market risk capital charge i took this from uh, uh, bcbs uh, website so they came up with minimum capital charge requirement for markets back in 1996 which was very coarse okay it was not very risk sensitive and then it went through a series of different uh, you know evolutions and they had basel 2.5 in 2009 there was a subsequent uh, amendment because there was there a lot of fallacies in this uh, this is just after crisis right the resulted okay the uh, methodology that we have provided in the standard is not uh, risk sensitive so there was an amendment and then this is the period where the project of frtb began frtb stands for fundamental review of the trading book and if you remember uh, we saw this uh, frtb in one of the job descriptions this is Today's, today's requirement in market risk is FRTB Python, only these two things. Okay, FRTB plus Python. If you know this, you'll get any job you want. This combination is a rare skill, all right? And that's what the focus of this course is. So FRTB project started here and then a couple of consulta consultation paper came up. And then in 2006, they came up with the revised standard. Okay, and then subsequently they found that it is still not. Uh, there are some some technical issues. We will go uh, look at that uh, when we go through the regulatory models. And finally, they have uh, frozen this standard in two thousand nineteen. They are calling it as revised standard, and this is effective from um, two thousand twenty three first Jan. Are banks ready to adopt this yet? No, everybody is in transitional phase. So when we talk about Basel models, right, whether you look at credit risk or market risk or operational risk or CVA, we'll talk about CVA a little bit. There are two, primarily two different methods they give. One is standardized approach, which is not sophisticated, uh, but it, I mean, it suits. Um, so if banks do not have adequate uh, tools or processes to model the things internally they will fall back on standardized approach and the other approach they have is advanced approach so big banks uh, who have data and people and process to manage those models internal models they will um, resort to internal models okay so at least today all banks have a way of calculating market risk capital charge uh, using uh, FRTB using at least the standardized approach that has already started. Um, okay. So, so yeah, so that's why you see a lot of these jobs in FRTB space today. <clears throat> okay. Uh, FRTB methodology quickly, I don't want to do a deep dive here because this will be the focus uh, of the course uh, going forward. But just to give you a high level, uh, this is the umbrella. So we have standardized approach. And then we have internal model approach, which is the advanced approach. Okay, so inside of internal model approach, we have three different items. One is uh, measure the core market risk capital charge using expected shortfall methodology. I think probably most of you already know value at risk. Don't worry, if you don't know, we'll do it uh, from scratch. But value at risk was the preferred methodology for more than 20 years. And then they finally came up with expected shortfall. So uh, if you look at the, if you compare the standards, right? Earlier we had 10 day, 99% value at risk uh, measured as the capital charge. But now we move to 97.5% expected shortfall. And it's not a blanket 10 day for every instrument. Why every in for every instrument we should have 10 days uh, liquidity horizon? No, not all instruments are liquid, uh, right? Some instruments will be liquid, some instruments will be illiquid. For instruments which are illiquid, I need to hold cap bigger capital. Because if things go wrong, I need to liquidate that uh, particular security. If it is illiquid, 
by the time i am able to uh, square my position already you know i will incur a big loss because of the bid ask spread so they proposed use 97.5% expected shortfall but for different asset classes use a different liquidity horizon do not use 10 day blanket 10 day for every instrument okay we'll talk more about this uh, and we'll see detailed calculations of how this is done then is uh, something called as non modelable risk factors this is the trickiest area that is troubling all the banks today uh, it's not very straightforward so what it means is when you model something where do you start where do you start you start from historical prices you look at historical data first right and then you put a build a model on top of it so there is a question are we going to cover modeling non modelable risk factors in python yes everything that you see will be doing in python if we are not i'm not covering something i'll call it out otherwise this is the disclaimer all of these will be in python okay so as i as i mentioned right when you mod want to model something you need to have a historical time series data for any risk factor now there could be risk factors which do not have data when we say data data as in uh, price data basel calls it as real price real price means what you can only trust the price if it is if you have already you have conducted a transaction with that price or that particular price is quoted in an exchange somewhere if there is no reliable information of the price then there is simply no data okay there are some risk factors for which there is no data and we call those as non modelable okay so technical definition would be factors which do not have real price history there are a lot of technical issues will go go, uh, go through this in our course but if you have non modelable risk factors right then we do a stress test and based on that stress test we calculate the capital charge it's not the regular expected shortfall route it's a different uh, different route through which we capitalize uh, non modelable risk factors and then the last one is default risk charge you would think why default risk is coming in market risk isn't it part of the uh, credit risk ideally yes but in trading book so tra what is what is uh, what is the difference between trading book and banking book in banking book we the banks typically hold those instruments for which the intent is to uh, keep it till maturity the intent is to receive interest in principal like your loans and hold it till maturity that's where that's when you put an instrument in the banking book in trading book your goal is not to hold things till maturity your goal is to do uh, speculation short term profits day to day trading okay so that's your trading book so market risk applies to trading book all right because your trading portfolio is sensitive to market price movements although there are you know fx and commodity risk in banking book also need to be capitalized under market risk that's one exception we'll we'll talk about all these uh, nuances uh, later on but question is why we are capturing default risk in market risk the answer is when you have instruments like bonds in trading book it is still possible that the issuer can default in the trading book okay so to capture the, the jt so jtd stands for jump to default risk in your trading book so there are instruments which are is, issued by entities and that is subject to default risk it's not like a loan or anything it's a bond but issuer may default so you have to capture that uh, that risk as well okay so that comes under market risk okay so that's internal models approach or advanced approach all right and there is a standardized approach so in standardized approach we have sensitivity based charge this is the king of market risk as i keep mentioning again and again it's all about sensitivity 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 so within sensitivity based capital charge you remember this slide um this particular path this then this then this and this this is exactly what the sensitivity uh, based approach is all about 
So we calculate delta, vega, and curvature risks. Let's not uh, you know dwell on these topics uh, in the interest of time. And there is default risk charge, which is uh, common, right? And there is a residual risk add-on. Okay. So what is residual risk add-on? So basically, when you do a risk mapping, you map it with systematic risk, general risks like uh, you know if your portfolio is sensitive to let's say usd to inr uh, rate okay that rate would affect many of the instruments for an indian bank so that is a systematic risk okay so broad risk factors in market okay changes in those will affect changes in your instrument value that's the systematic risk but other than that whatever is left which are very much uh, issuer specific or you can call it idiosyncratic risk for that also we need to put i mean calculate capital so anything that is not captured in the prime risk factors or broad risk factors is part of the residual risk add-ons uh, we have separate calculation for that okay so all of these uh, we will learn uh, in this course for every instrument when i say every instrument will take basically uh, the common instruments for each of the asset class like so interest rate fx equity commodity and we'll calculate all this uh, capital charge both under ima and standardized approach and then the next step would be to take portfolios bond portfolio option portfolio stock portfolio and then be able to calculate all of this uh, for them everything in python okay so that's what uh, will be the focus of this course now quick uh, very quickly i'll i'll uh, try to wrap up everything in another 10 minutes not more than that uh when so th that this is all about market risk okay so this this is what the th what we'll be covering in our course when we talk about counterparty credit risk i wanted to present the broad ideas of counterparty credit risk in one slide so not to, to you know do a, a deep dive uh, here but uh, yeah so as much as possible i just try to give a over, overview of the different uh, types of risk that are present in a uh, in, in a derivative transaction when we talk about counterparty credit risk it means it's it's a derivative trade you have a counterparty right uh, let's say you are long then your counterparty is short uh, then what are the different types of risks that you need to capitalize Okay, let's say we entered into a derivative transaction. A and B entered into a derivative trade. This is different from credit risk because the exposure is bilateral. Why? Because when in, in lending, what happens? Bank will always have exposure to the obligor. It is the obligor who has to pay back, right? Um, so there is a question from Ronak. It's is it OTC derivative? So answer is yes otc derivatives and also there are exchange traded derivatives for which also there is a capital charge although you would think uh, can uh, ccp central counterparty default idea is no but still there is a two percent uh, risk weight that you have to um, uh, use as a risk weight to capitalize your exposures with central counterparty so basically all exchange traded derivatives that also undergoes capitalization. We will talk about it uh, in detail in the course. <clears throat> okay, so um, yeah, the bilateral exposure. So as I said, right in credit risk, it is mostly lending risk. Your exposure is in one direction, unilateral from bank. Uh, so it, bank has exposure, not the obligor. But in derivative transaction, the value can swing both ways right sometimes value of for from the perspective of a could be positive sometimes it could be positive for b so the exposure is bilateral now let's say at some so this derivative was initiated after some time t small t the value of the derivative for a is v a t okay it is somewhere here let's say so it is positive now what is the value of the derivative it is va right but today we actually capture the fair value of derivative v s star call it v s star which is the 
mark to market value of the derivative from the perspective of a with an credit value adjustment cva cva stands for credit value adjustment why do we do this is because when we value any derivative think of uh, black scholes option value we do not take counterparty's default probability in that valuation right so to calculate fair value of the derivative we need to do some adjustment because uh, to, to, to account for the potential default of the counterparty. So this is called credit value adjustment. There are, okay, so it started with CVA, but uh, there are lots of VAs today. If you see uh, literature today, banks are calculating FVA, KVA, COLVA, NVA, all, yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, all of these are very nuanced topics, okay? There are very different methodologies for calculating XVA, but for this course, we'll only focus on CVA. The reason being, this is the only thing that is capitalized today. We are not capitalizing uh, DVA, FVA on those things. Okay, so the purpose of this course is uh, regulatory capital models. We will focus on CVA calculation and the, market, the capital charge that uh, is associated with CVA. All right, but I have covered everything in uh, the bootcamp in quant finance. So if you um, are interested uh, to enroll in that course, we I mean feel free to uh, contact us after this one. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is the value of the derivative, right? Fair value of the derivative. Now looking at this equation, what are the different types of risks that you can think of that we need to capitalize? Risk is essentially the potential loss that can happen, okay? First and foremost, the value of the derivative itself, that will be subject to the movement in market prices. Simple example, call option, value of the call option will change if the underlier changes. That means if the stock price changes, the value of the derivative will change. So that part is captured under market risk. This is the part that we just talked about, right? Uh, we'll take sensitivities uh, of the derivative. For example, let's say black shows uh, delta. And then use that to calculate the change in value of the derivative. That is capitalized. This part is capitalized under market risk. Simply because this part is vulnerable to market price movements, which is in this case is the underlier. Okay, the second um, second part of the risk is the issue, the counterparty can default. Counterparty can default as in he will not pay back the money. If he owes us, he will not pay back the money. Now, we don't know when the counterparty will default. In credit risk, we typically take one year PD, right? Here, we don't know uh, when the counterparty will default. So there is a concept called MPOR, margin period of risk. Okay, so there is calculation of that. It basically, uh, MPOR is, um, it, it tells you um, from today, if the counterparty defaults in, in future, based on your margin agreements, how soon you will be able to discover that default event and be able to replace all your existing trades with the based on the uh, current market prices in the market that entire period is called npor in this entire period you remain vulnerable okay so there is calculation behind this we'll look at that so basically your future exposure at the time of default right or, or at uh, the end of npor could be anything Okay, future value of the derivative. So today it is VA, but at capital T, it could be anything. So primarily what we do in this space is do, we'll do a Monte Carlo simulation to find out the exposure profile of the derivative at a future time point. All right, that's the first step. And from there, we calculate a host of important statistics, expected exposure, potential future exposure, 
effective expected positive exposure okay don't get overwhelmed i know there are lot, it's a lot of technical stuff here but i'm just giving a broad picture this slide will be helpful for you to you know go back and uh, assimilate the the big picture what is happening actually right so the simple fact is we captured the market risks uh, the change in the value of the potential change in the value of the derivative through market risk uh, capital charge right and the other aspect is the default of the counterparty correct so for that we don't know when the counterparty will default uh, so we estimate something called mpor that's the margin period of risk at that time there could be a range of possible values of your exposure from this profile we will calculate so this is sort of like an average exposure but we only take the positive values and then take the average and this is like a value at risk kind of calculation but it's on the positive side and this is a bit complicated uh, let's not focus on it so we'll calculate all these and then these values will serve uh, for two different types of uh, risk so we'll, let's let's talk about it first one is this cva right cva is what credit value adjustment now this cva can change because when i recorded cva that was based on the credit spread of the counterparty b right credit value adjustment is based on the credit spread of b now in future credit spread of b can change so my cba will change all right and remember in market risk we capture credit spread risk correct so this part the variability in cva part is also part of market risk and for that the inputs would be expected exposure credit spread of b these two go into cva calculation and because of the variability in CVA, because potentially the credit spread of B can change, we capitalize change in CVA under CVA capital charge. There is separate calculation for capitalizing CVA. Okay. <clears throat> there is one more risk. And that risk is the actual default of the counterparty. Here, I only captured the potential deterioration in credit worthiness, which is the change in credit spread. What about the actual default? That's part of the credit risk, okay? If the counterparty defaults, whatever exposure you have, you lose that, that much money, right? So for that, there is another sequence of calculations. So we have potential future exposure combined with margin and collateral information of the trade that rolls up to exposure at default calculation and you know that exposure at default calculation is the key ingredient one of the key ingredients in credit risk calculation right uh, now exposure in case of lending risk is easy to calculate typically you have a loan you know how much is the exposure sometimes you have to have the amortization schedule but the exposure is very easily modelable in credit risk when it comes to derivatives exposure is stochastic we we don't know exposure can swing both ways it could be positive it could be negative so at the time of default what would be the exposure that's tricky to model so we use monte carlo simulation so pfe margin collateral information go to ead calculation within ead there are two methods one is saccr which is standardized approach for counterparty credit risk and the other is imm which is internal models method as I mentioned, it's the standard theme in Basel calculations. We always have a standardized approach and we always have an advanced approach. So the EAD calculation, right, uh, for counterparty credit risk, for that we have two separate approaches. And once you calculate EAD, that goes into your, the, the EAD enters into the credit risk capital charge equation, which is the risk of counterparty default. So to summarize, I mean, I, probably this is overwhelming, but I, I wanted to really wanted to give you this picture because this picture is missing. Trust me, you will not have this picture anywhere unless you have studied Basel guidelines and spent significant amount of time in counterparty credit risk. So just to summarize, variability in value of the trade, market risk, right? Simply underlier changes, value of the rate you can change, how much I can lose, market risk. Credit value adjustment that is based on 
the credit worthiness of the counterparty, the adjustment that I do every time, every single time, that can potentially change because the credit worthiness deteriorated or the spread, spread, spread of my counterparty changed. That is capitalized under a separate calculation, set of calculations called CVA capital charge. And the third is the actual default of the counterparty, uh, the counterparty which is part of the credit risk. Uh, EAD calculation is tricky. For that, we have two methods, SSCCR, IMM. Uh, and then this part, is, this part is the regular credit risk. So whether you are using standardized approach or uh, IRB, uh, based on that, you will uh, calculate PD, LGD, and multiply with EADs, and you are done. So what we will cover in this course? In this course, we will cover, expo so I have that slide here. So let's, let's come here. We will cover exposure modeling because that's the key ingredient. You need to be able to quantify exposure at any future point in time of a derivative. So for FRA, we have exposure profiles, E, P, F, E, plot, you can see. All of these have been done in Excel, but everything will do in Python. Okay. Uh, this is the exposure profile of interested swap. So we'll learn how to do exposure modeling. And then we will also learn how to calculate capital charge for CVA using both these methods, standardized approach and advanced method. And EAD calculation, this is part of the credit risk, right? Uh, using st SSCCR, standardized approach for counterparty credit risk and internal models method. So we'll take sample instruments, calculate uh, exposures, ex and calculate key statistics of each of the instruments, EE, PFE, um, effective, expected, positive exposure, all those things, and then calculate CVA capital charge and EAD, uh, which will be potentially used in credit risk capital charge calculation. Okay, I know it's a lot of details, but but yeah. All right, so learning roadmap very quickly is goes like this. Um, in the first module, we'll talk, we'll uh, take, uh, we'll, we'll go through Python basics. So I'll take live classes uh, for, you know, uh, on Python. These are some of the important uh, libraries, NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib that we'll spend some time on. And next would be, Really, the name of the chapter would be y equal to f of x. That's, that's the name of the chapter. Uh, the reason being, in market risk, this y equal to f of x thinking is crucial. When I say y, it is the value of the instrument. When I say x, it is the risk factor. Okay. How do we translate or roll up changes from x to y? Once you master this particular chapter, right? All these formulas that you see in FRTV will come naturally to you. You can write those formulas without even referring to the text. Okay, it's not, not rocket science. So the focus will be on sensitivity calculation, option Greeks, Taylor C's series uh, expansion will be the king. Okay, I do have uh, primer videos on this, so that will be shared. And uh, yeah, then we'll learn how to calculate value at risk and expected shortfall for, for simple instruments using the three different methods, historical, parametric, Monte Carlo. Once we are thorough with this part, in the next module, we'll look at, uh, so this, is, this will be done uh, for single instruments. Then we'll look at how we can uh, do all these calculations for a portfolio, okay? So portfolio mapping, uh, systematic specific VAR, there is a uh, factor models and principal component analysis. Lots of banks calculate uh, principal components and then they use that to calculate uh, systematic uh, value at risk. So we'll look at that. And then we'll take sample portfolios. There is a bond portfolio, different types of instruments, how to calculate value at risk and expected shortfall using these three different methods for a portfolio, stock portfolio, option portfolio. <clears throat> and then once we are thorough with this, the third module will be entire regulatory focus. So we'll take the regulatory text. There are 136 pages, okay? 136 pages of FRTB document. We'll go paragraph by paragraph. I'll show you the calculation and we'll implement everything for a, a sample portfolio in Python. Okay, so standardized approach, advanced approach, <clears throat> 
Then there is also something called as PNL attribution and backtesting. Uh, so this is like a reality check. Okay, backtesting means okay you calculated value at risk, but how good is that model? Um, let's say you calculated value at risk for uh, ninety five percent. That means on any given day your loss, uh, the chances of exceeding chances of the loss exceeding value at risk should not be more than five percent. If it is more than five percent, then your model is wrong. That's part of backtesting. PNL attribution is profit and loss attribution. So basically, the risk factors that you have considered for market risk are they adequate to describe the daily PNL of the instruments, or are you missing something? Okay, so that's PNL attribution. So this is also part of the regulatory text. We'll we'll uh, look at that. And then we'll go through some of the model validation uh, checks and balances. So what are the common checks that we do in model validation? validation? We'll also review SR 11.7, uh, which is uh, guidelines on model risk. And then um, there, there are some case studies from the past that we'll look at. Uh, so there is a question, do we cover stress testing? Yes, we'll cover stress testing as well. And there was an earlier question related to Quant finance uh, look at, uh, volatility modeling. Um, okay, so that's a, we, we'll talk about that uh, probably after this one because it's a little uh, different. Um, okay, so and in the final module, it will be focused on uh, CCR exposure modeling, as I mentioned, right? All of these exposure statistics that we'll calculate for different types of instruments uh, in Python, then EAD modeling, SSCR, IMM. CVA calculation and CVA capital charge in Python. All right, so that's over. That's the overall syllabus. This is not cast in stone, okay? This is still a little flexible, but what I'm saying is at a minimum, we'll cover this. And we might add some, uh, you know, more content to this depending on relevant. And there will be interview questions, mock uh, interview questions, practice assignments, so, so that uh, you get a complete end-to-end -end, um, understanding, and uh, you can uh, you can ace the interviews. All right. So that that's that's the goal, right? All right. So I'll open the floor for Q and A. Sorry, it uh, got it took a little longer. Um, all right. Let me stop recording. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>